Chapter 2 The Pinecone Munitions Factory is made up of half a dozen large, single-story clapboard buildings set on piles of concrete blocks. These unsightly structures were built during World War II for the emergency production of exploding shells. Pinecone was selected for the location of this facility precisely because it was small, insignificant, and remote, though not so very far from the important base of Fort Rucker, then technically only a camp, and because a congressional representative from Alabama on the Armed Services Committee had a nephew who owned a tract of land in the pine cone, which, because it was good for nothing at all, screamed out to be purchased at a fabulous sum by the wartime government. The plant during the war employed a great number of people, and these lucky ones, many of whom had not known employment since the beginning of the Depression, actually dreaded the end of the great conflict in Europe and the Pacific because that would mean the cessation of weekly pay envelopes, which, if not generous, were at least regular. They were right for directly after Japan surrendered, the railway stopped bringing into Pinecone the carloads of parts that had been so easily assembled into the bullet-shaped instruments of destruction. The people who worked at the factory were let go and they wandered disconsolately about the town, making trouble late in the night, consuming great amounts of bootleg whiskey, an industry that was not affected by the end of World War II, and uh, wondering what they were going to do next. Unknown to them, however, the buildings had been sold privately, without bidding, at a scandalously low sum, to the first cousin of the Alabama congressional representative who had got the plant located there in the first place. When questioned regarding the property of this, the Alabama congressman replied that the family had a sentimental attachment to the acres in Pine Cone and wished to retain them in the family. He wasn't sure, but he thought that his great-grandmother might have been buried in the vicinity. The machinery that had put together exploding shells was quickly converted for the assembly of a kind of rifle then much in favor with the army. Modifications suggested by the Pentagon general, who was rapid on the subject of repeating rifles, were incorporated, and before long, a large government contract had been awarded to the Pine Cone Munitions Factory. Though as yet it had only its physical facilities as capital, half a dozen menial office workers as many more incompetent executives and no stock whatsoever. The workers had hired back as fast as they could sober up, and since that time the Pine Cone Munitions Factory has turned out many millions of firearms, which have been employed in training camps mostly, but also in Korea and more recently in Vietnam. The factory employs nearly 500 workers, a full quarter of Pinecone's population that works out to a much heftier percentage of the town's adult ambulatory sane population. The executives are hometown men who are not very bright but can be trusted by the owners of the plant to do exactly what they are told. All the girls who go away to college or to vocational school can be sure to find a place in the office of the plant when they return to Pinecone to support their mothers, or wait on their fathers, or humor their husbands, they are secretaries and file clerks. The white men in town work the heavy machinery and are trained in a specific skill that is sufficient to earn them a weekly paycheck and keep them busy for 40 hours a week, but does not have too much meaning or application outside the factory. But it is the woman of Pinecone at least the white women who keep the place going, for they are put to work on the assembly line, setting in screws and adjusting the sights and locking in the barrel of every rifle that lurches past the conveyor belt. The management of the factory has found that it is best to have women in these boring jobs because they are more patient than their husbands and brothers. 
less likely to complain of low wages, and they do not scurry about for promotions. Without these wives and daughters and sisters of Pinecone, the family of the Alabama congressional representative, he has never been defeated for re-election, would have a great deal less money than it possesses at this time. The black men are put on maintenance crews about the factory, and it is their responsibility to see that the buildings are kept in repair, that no damage comes to the machinery through grime or sabotage, and that the parking lot is kept free of liquor bottles. Black women are put to work after hours in the buildings, sweeping the place clean every night of candy wrappers, spent shells, and iron filings are spewed out of the dye presses. The management of the plant contrives in summer to find mean positions for the sullen teenagers of Pinecone, having them endlessly restack empty crates or spray letters and complicated directions onto the sides of boxes that are to be burned or destroy the raccoons and skunks that make their homes in great numbers beneath the buildings. In addition to these, several high school senior boys are employed year-round for a few hours each day after school. Their job is to test the rifles. They stand out in a clearing a few hundred yards from the factory buildings and fire again and again at targets several dozen yards away or sometimes for variety at birds that fly overhead. The rifles are loaded for them by two senior boys from the county high school for blacks, for the management is never seeing young black men holding rifles. The white boys become quite proficient in the course over the year, and when they subsequently enter the army, by choice or by ill fortune, it is not infrequently that they are awarded medals and commendations for sharpshooting. Dean Howell had been one of these. He had been very familiar with that kind of rifle that destroyed his face and a large part of his brain. The Pinecone Munitions Factory was like the town of Pinecone itself, insofar as both were small and mean. The owners of the plant made a good deal of money off the place, and it caused them not a whit of trouble. The plant made one kind of rifle, that is, it assembled one kind of rifle. The parts were manufactured in other places, in Detroit, in Des Moines, and then shipped to Alabama. A few special pieces that could not be obtained elsewhere were stamped out in pine cone, but the metal plates were forged in Pennsylvania and brought in once a month out on the LNN spur. A more aggressive owner would have expanded the capacity of the plant, diversified the manufacture, upgraded and streamlined the facilities, but really what need was there? The family members of the congressmen were lazier than they were greedy, and they liked to spend all their time in their houses on the Florida Gulf Coast. They got checks every month, which were very handsome, and once a year, they threw away the annual report without even looking at it. Once in a while, they worried vaguely about a union coming in and making trouble, or fretted that the minimum wage was going to be raised again or they dreaded being sued for negligence in the event of an industrial accident, but they didn't concern themselves so much that their tans faded, and they invariably decided against reinvesting profits to increase the safety precautions in the plant buildings. The Alabama congressional representative had a grandnephew who went to business school somewhere in the north and came to his great uncle with all sorts of ideas on how to maximize long-term profit for the Pine Co. Munitions Factory, which he had never laid eyes on. The Alabama congressional representative explained carefully to a young man that until he got rid of such ideas entirely, he was not to go near the place. It made money for your mama and your grandma. It made money for me, and it sent you through eight years of school in the goddamn north. You don't touch it, and maybe it'll get you through the rest of your life so that you can afford to have all these crazy ideas that you want. The Alabama congressional representative was a savvy man that you wouldn't have known it to hear what the grandnephew had to say about him after this interview.